So I had some emails uh, and a bunch of questions on WebAssign. Uh, I think I've answered all the questions on WebAssign. I did that this morning, so everything that existed then. Um, but some of the questions I just answered by saying I'll answer them later. So here's that. Uh, one of the big questions uh, from your homework was about this function, which was something like this, like a, like a cosine function divided by some function involving sine. So I'll, I'll give this variation from homework. Uh, and the question was to find, there's lots of questions about it, I think, but perhaps this one is just find the domain of the function. Now, I've talked about this generally, like what is the domain of a function, uh, but I've not really like given you specific tools for doing things like that. Um, I just said it was all the allowed inputs. So let me give you some general tools, which you then apply to specific problems. So first, uh, compute where division by zero takes place. Okay, so in any problem where you've got a division sign, uh, the first tool that you should utilize is just computing where you're dividing by zero. Okay, and so in this problem, that would be solving one plus sine x equals zero. Find all those inputs x where you get a zero result. The second tool is going to be be careful of negatives. This would be compute where negatives are in roots. Uh, I'll say roots and logarithms down here. So for now, those are the two guys that we need to work or worry about: roots and logs. Um, fortunately, in this problem, we don't have to, we don't have any roots. We don't have any logarithms. And aside from those two tools, um, sort of the, the third most general tool is you just need to have a lot of knowledge about functions. And I know that's like, hey, you know, in order to fix something, you need to fix it. You know, that's like it's very impractical advice. Uh, but when you have a good knowledge of functions, then you, then when you start composing the basic functions together, uh, into more complicated things, then you can determine the domains of the more complicated things, right? So having a good knowledge of basic functions like square roots or even roots or logarithms or uh, trig functions, um, when you start combining them, like in this case, that's where you, you know, you can determine the domain of its more complicated things. Okay, so this was the specific question though from homework. So. Tool two doesn't really apply. Tool one, computing where division by zero takes place, does apply. And we're just going to solve one plus sine x. Uh, so what is sine of x? I've drawn this a couple times. So we take the unit circle. That means it's got radius one. This point here is the origin. That's zero comma zero. And if you pick any point along the unit circle, two things are true. Uh, the first one is that the x coordinate is actually cosine of the angle, and the y coordinate is the sine of the angle. And this is the angle formed by taking the x axis and sliding it up so that this point rotates up to that point. So this angle we call x. That's the first thing that's true. The second thing that's true. Uh, which is very useful for making guesses around here, is that there's a relationship between these two. If you take the x-coordinate and square it, you can take the y-coordinate and square it, you always get 1, because it's the unit circle. This is called the Pythagorean theorem. 
Pythagorean identity. Um, right. So, where are those points, or what are those points on the unit circle um, where we have division by zero? Well, that's where we have sine of x equaling negative 1. So sine of x is the y-coordinate, right? So where is the y-coordinate negative 1? If you think about points on the unit circle, you need this to be negative 1. What's the x-coordinate? Zero. Has to be zero. You can think about it two different ways. The x coordinate plus the y coordinate squares of them has to equal one. If this is one or negative one, when you square it, you get one. So that means this square must be zero. So that's like the first way to think about it. The next, the other way to think about it is just geometrically, we've got a radius of one circle. So we can sort of slide this around the circle. And think about the different points that exist. Here's one, it's 0, 1. It's 1 because we're going one unit straight up. This one over here is negative 1, 0. We've moved to the left in the x-coordinate 1. So it's the left 1. And then we can go straight down where we've got 0, negative 1, which is the point we're interested in. Because here, the y-coordinate is negative 1. So what's that angle? You can think about it two ways. You can go backwards or sort of clockwise. Um, I say backwards because usually we go anti-clockwise on the unit circle. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, but this is clockwise as seen from your direction. And this is an angle of negative pi over 2 or negative 90 degrees. And that brings us to this here. Or you could go forwards. I'm going to erase some of this bloody and stuff. You can go anti-clockwise, 3 pi over 2, or 270 degrees. Those two angles are coterminal. They end at the same point on the unit circle. But those aren't the only ones. And if you think about these two as a pair, 270 degrees minus 360 degrees is negative 90 degrees. If you think of them as sort of a pair, they're coterminal, which means they're separated by an angle of 360 degrees. That means we can generate more of them just by saying any angle, so any angle, I'll write it as equals for now, any angle that equals 270 plus or minus 360 degrees times some multiple is also coterminal with 270, right? All of those angles sort of line up right there. And these are all of the angles which make this 0, which means our domain cannot have any of those angles in it. Because if we do have them, we're dividing by 0, and that's not allowed. OK, so in this problem, again, we just We've been given a function. We see there's division. So we computed where we are dividing by 0, which means we're solving where the denominator is equal to 0, which means it's all of these angles. So what is the domain of our original? It is any number except those. There's several ways to write that. All reals minus, and you just say in a bracket, uh, say 270 degrees plus or minus 360 degrees times n. You could say, you know, a set of all x such that x is not equal to 270 degrees plus or minus 360 degrees n. I wouldn't suggest this, but you could also do like a giant union 
of intervals, and the intervals would be split up at these guys. That would just be a lot of intervals, so I would just not do that. But that's that's it for this question, which I had some emails and web assigned questions on. So that should settle it for everyone. Right? We have questions on that. We're settled. If not, speak up now. Oh, right. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, you get five attempts unless you send me an email, and then I'll give you more. But um, I could change everything else in the answer, so I don't think. Right, so WebAssign does the attempts <coughs> per blank box. So, like, this question might have had multiple parts to it. And you can submit each part individually, and it counts submissions individually. So. Just email me if you want more, more submission attempts. That's fine. I, I put it at five because I, I think like that might be enough for most people to work through it. But uh, if it's not, that's fine. Just email me. Okay. So you need more attempts? No. No. Yes. No. Okay. I just got one of the things. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Can you write, can they still be like integers? No, there has to be a limit. And it's like a token that doesn't have any limit. Yeah, so that's one way of interpreting what trig functions are is with angles. But just generally speaking, they're just numbers. So what numbers can be plugged into these functions? Angles or not, you can plug in any number that does not match that pattern. Um, typically, these are not done with degrees because degrees are at like a unit, or a unit of measure. Typically, degrees are converted into radians, which is technically a, a, a measurement, a length along the unit circle. Um, one radian, by the way, as an angle measure, is equal exactly to the length of the radius of the circle along which you're traveling. So. If I took this circle, and say, hey, it's not a unit circle. It has some radius r. And then I map out a radian, like exactly one radian for an angle. So I'm going to just draw the same angle. So this is one radian. That angle literally corresponds to taking this radius length and like it's a string, fixing one end here and placing it as best as I can around the edge of the circle. This length is exactly r, and the angle inscribed is one radian. Um, so radians are just a real number. It's not necessarily an angle, it's just a real number. Yeah, so like I said last time, I didn't quite get to exponentials and logarithms, so I'm going to do that now. Um, there's not too much on it from the book, but logarithms and exponentials are inverse functions for one another. So this is 1.2 continued, and it's just logs and exponentials, and then I'll move right along to 1.3. So this will end the catalog, spelled C-A-T-A-L-O-G. Um, this will end the catalog for us. So there's like this really, really succinct way of, of describing the relationship between these two things, which I'll get to next. But an exponential is just a function, as I've said before, uh, of the form a to the x. This is an exponential function. It's some number a greater than zero 
raised to some variable amount. And we looked at last time, if a is bigger than 1, we have exponential growth. And the graph looks something like this. And if a is in this interval from 0 to 1, so it's some number between 0 and 1. That means it's like a fraction smaller than 1, like 1 half, 1 third, what have you. Then we have something called exponential decay, and it looks something like this. I'll just dot my hand. Growth, and this is decay. All right, so that's just a quick review of those. If I asked you the question, you know, if I asked you not to compute the value of a to the x given an x. If I asked you instead the inverse question of, for example, find x when you know that 8 equals 2 to the x. It's the inverse question, right? Instead of giving you the input, I've given you the output, and I've asked, hey, what was the input? Um, what you're actually doing is you're computing a logarithm. A logarithm describes the powers of some base. Okay, It's 3 here, right? The power must be 3. How do I know that? Because the log base 2 of 8 is 3. So the logarithms and exponentials sort of answer the same question but in opposite directions. So I'll put that down next. And then I'll give you the succinct relationship between them. So a logarithm is a function of this form. It's literally the word L O G. Then there's some base, usually subscripted below the, the log. It's just a number. It's like a decoration that's placed below the G there. And then of X. Log base P of X is how you say that. P, like here, is some number greater than zero. And... So just a few quick examples, things you've seen before, especially on your calculator. If there's nothing written here, this is the log base 10 of x. This is a very common logarithm. Um, because you know, does anyone know why this is such a common logarithm? And if you nodded, why do we use this one very commonly? Oh, scientific notation has something to do with it, I guess. Yeah, that's this is really easy to use with scientific notation. Right? This is, you, you have like times 10 to some power at the end, so if you take logarithms, that power pops out. Okay, that, that's one very good reason. Another really good reason? Yeah. Our entire number system, like for everyday people, is what base? That base, base 10. Like when you literally write down a number 321, this is literally 1 times 10 to the 0 plus 2 times 10 to the 1st plus 3 times 10 squared. Our entire numbering system is based entirely on powers of 10. It's called the decimal system. Uh, it's not always the case that we use base 10, which is why there are awesome other logarithms. Ln of x is log base e. That's Euler's number. It's one of those transcendentals that we talked about. 
And then those of you who are computer scientists out there who work in binary a lot, uh, LG of X is base 2, the log base 2 of X. And as I said before, the logarithm essentially answers the question about the power of the exponential. You know, so if I plug in a number, um, working with such little board face is problematic. Can I erase? Um, can I erase the the entirety of it? Is that okay? I gave you this question, I give you a base, I specify a base, and then I throw a number into it, a um, thousand. What I'm really looking for here is the power of the base. In this case, what's the base? The base is 10, which equals exactly the input. So for any logarithm, there's going to be a base written, and then there's going to be an input. And what your answer is, what it computes to, is literally the power, the exponential, of this, which definitely gives you that. Okay, so in this one, what power of 10 gives you 1,000? Three, yeah, so this is just three. Okay, how about, uh, uh, you know, something like this. Ln of e squared, what does that give you? Two. What power of e gives you e squared? It better be two. <laughs> okay, so that, that's the logarithm uh, sort of computation. And now succinctly, what's the relationship between logarithms and exponentials? It's that the two forms, a to the c equals b. So if you have some exponential that's written like this, or rather if you have some number which is computed by taking a to some power, then definitely, and maybe I should change my numbers or letters. It doesn't really matter what they are, but just to keep B sort of as a base. If you know this relationship holds, if you've got some exponential relationship with the number A, then you definitely know something about a logarithm base b. You know that the logarithm base b of a is c. So by definition, what power of this gives us this? Well, if we know c, the b of c gives us a, well then clearly the power is c. Vice versa, if we know this to be the case, then we know that is the case. This is the, this is the equivalence relation between logarithms and exponentials. Um, and you can literally switch back and forth between them to help you solve problems. Questions about logs and exponentials? I, I'm pretty sure that's it. Well, just as a reminder, the homework for 1.1 and 1.2 is due tomorrow night at midnight. Um, section 1.3, which is what we're going to get into now, that's not due till next Thursday.
section one, section one point three is on getting new functions from old functions. So this is where this is where things start getting a bit messier. We're going to work with algebraic functions and transcendental functions, and we're going to work with uh, combining them together in different ways. So this is new functions. And it's, you know, hopefully going to be pretty straightforward for us. So if you think about functions as the graphs for a minute, you remember that every function satisfies the vertical line test. And what that means is, according to the definition, that for every input, so for every x number uh, along our x-axis, if we go up or down to the output of our function, it only has one. Okay? So for every graph, I'm going to erase this briefly. So for if I pick some x, and here's my graph, if I go down and if I go up, I should only ever touch my graph one time. Because to this one input, there can only be one associated output. That's the definition of a function. So what can we do to graphs of functions? So we can just shift them left and right. We can shift them up and down. And nothing changes in terms of having a function or not. Right? We just move it up, we still have a function. Move it down, we still have a function. We move it left and right, we still have functions. So how is that accomplished? So vertical shifts are accomplished by adding or subtracting to the end result. So f of x is the result of the input put into our function. If we then add a number to that, all we're doing is we're adding extra height to the output of our function. We're lifting it up by c. If we subtract some positive number, we're taking our function, we're reducing it down, we're lowering it down. Okay? So this is the output is adjusted up and down. This one, horizontal shifting, is done in a slightly different way. It's like that. Instead of adjusting the output of our function, we first adjust the input. This one is always the one that sort of gets students if they're not familiar or haven't seen this thing before. With vertical shifting, adding a positive number raises it up. Subtracting a positive number brings it down. Here, things are sort of opposite from what you would expect. So if you add a positive number, it makes you think you're going to move the graph right. Yeah? But in reality, it moves it left. Okay, and if you subtract a positive number, it's like you know, you're moving things to the left, right? Subtraction, moving left. But that's not what happens to the graph. It moves to the right. Okay, does anyone have an explanation as to why that happens? Adding to the input moves it left. Subtracting from the input moves it right. Why? Take a stab at it. Okay, go for it. This is great. This is great. So look at the input when when the input's zero. Yeah, that has the effect of if you're subtracting, 
plugging in a negative number. So what used to be graphed at some negative value is now graphed at 0. You plug in 0, and it takes what was over here and moves it over to that point. Perfect. That was a great explanation. Did everyone catch that? Yeah. I see blank stairs, maybe. I don't know if they're blank stairs. I can't see faces, half of them at least. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. Better than I can tell. You've got a career ahead of yourself in this stuff if you want, for sure. Yes? Yeah, of course. So, I'll give a concrete example of that. Um, Yeah, so we'll take we'll take like the graph of x squared. Okay, and then we'll adjust it, let's say by like one. So I haven't graphed it yet, but I've subtracted a positive number. I subtracted 1 from the input prior to evaluating anything. So what he suggested was, you know, if you consider what happens with 0, before, when we plugged in 0, we got 0 out. But now when we plug in 0, It's as if we plugged in negative 1 to our original equation. What do we have at negative 1 over here? We have 1. So what was back here at negative 1 before is now what we get when we plug in 0. get 1. If we plug in other things, like now let's say we plug in 1, that's just like plugging in the 0 that we plugged in before. So we plug in 1 now, and that's the same as plugging in 0 from up here, and we get 0. So this graph moves over. Um, another explanation that I've seen is like this, it's, it's like what you do to the y-axis. So if you're subtracting something like this, x minus 1, if we step back and we think about the y-axis instead, doing this essentially moves the y-axis this many things to the left. It places the y-axis at this x value. It's another way to think. And then it renumbers the whole y-axis. So you take this graph, you subtract 1, so now our y-axis is here at negative 1. And then we erase all the labels on the x-axis. This is now 0. This is now negative 1. This is now 1, et cetera, et cetera. So, a nice way to get a new function from an old function is just to shift it left, right, up, or down. You can combine them together to get a diagonal shift as well. These just in general are called translations. Um, the next one is um, things called dilations. Um, So this is another way to call it is uh, vertical stretching, which is essentially taking, taking and grabbing the graph and stretching it out like this so that it's taller and essentially thinner as well. Um, or you can compress it, which is where we 
imagine taking the picture of our graph and smooshing it together. So vertical stretching and compressing. This also has no effect on that vertical line test. So we still, after doing this sort of thing, end up with a function. How is this done? The vertical stretching and compressing takes the output of a function and then multiplied by something. Okay. Now that something is stretching if A is bigger than 1. Makes sense. When you multiply by something bigger than 1, things get bigger. So if you're taking the heights of your original function and multiplying by something bigger than 1, then the heights get higher. Correspondingly, in the negative direction, a negative number becomes more negative. Compressing happens when we have this business. You pick some fraction, some number between 0 and 1, and that just means that all the old heights, all the old outputs of our function are now a fraction of their previous height. Okay, so this is a modification of our output of a function through multiplication by some number. I guess as an aside, if A is negative, what happens to our graph? In addition to vertical stretching and compressing, what happens to the graph? It's upside down. Flips it. Every negative becomes positive, every positive becomes negative. This uh, this is just essentially flipping the graph. Nice concrete example, something we just looked at. X squared, multiplying it by negative one. results in an identical graph. If I could draw such a thing, I would, but it is flipped. The x-axis is Okay, questions on that? Okay. The next one is horizontal stretching and compressing. This also has no effect on whether or not the result is a function still. And as you might guess, with our shifting left and right, uh, horizontal stretching and compressing also has uh, sort of a strange feel to it, I, I find. So, horizontal things, uh, we deal with modifying the input again. And we're not going to be adding and subtracting. We're going to be multiplying the input. Sorry? Sorry. Oh, of course. Oh, okay. You know, you get so focused on something. I know it's not just me. You get so focused on something. Sorry. Bless you, whoever that was. Were you? Are you okay? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. All right. Any, any other social things that I should have picked up on in the last one minute or anything? I tend to miss these things. I really do. No? <clears throat> so, horizontal things, you know, we modify the input typically. Vertical, we modify, we modify the output typically. So, for horizontal stretching and compressing, we're going to multiply x by something. We're going to take our x and just and scale it, okay? And I always need to make sure that I get this right because I messed this up as well. So we have stretching and compressing in the following cases. Compressing is if a is bigger than 1. And the nice way to think about that is the inputs come faster and faster and faster than they used to. Stretching occurs when you take something in that 
0 to 1 interval, so a fraction. The way to think about that is the inputs are now sort of slowed down in the rate at which they normally come, which is at one times speed. Literally one times the input is the normal speed. But if you have a fractional speed, now the inputs come at a slower rate. So you have this, this the normal x-axis, now things are more stretched out because they sort of hit the function at a slower rate. So again, horizontally, things are backwards. Or at least they seem to be backwards somehow. In some way. Um, a couple examples, I guess, for these things. We'll do a horizontal stretch of the same function x squared. So this is our normal function, and we'll stretch it by taking x and we'll multiply it by 1 half. Okay. Original function, and here I actually have to be a little careful with how I graph things. This is 1, this is negative 1, this is 2, negative 2. So when we plugged in 0 to the original, we got 0. When we plugged in 1, we get 1. When we plugged in negative 1, we get negative 1. So 2, 4. And similarly over here. So our graph originally has this nice shape to it. This is x squared. It's going to be in red now. 1 half x squared is the same as 1 fourth x squared. So maybe you're seeing a relationship here between sometimes horizontally stretching and compressing and vertically stretching and compressing. This graph is going to be the same as a vertically compressed graph. You take this and you vertically compress it 1 fourth times. That's going to be identical to horizontally stretching it one half times. Okay, so there's there are some relationships between these two things. So one fourth x squared. When we plugged in zero, we still got zero. We can't stretch the center point out. We plug in one to this and we get one fourth. Plug in negative one, we get negative one fourth. We get positive one fourth, but over here on the negative one side. We plug in two and we get one. Negative two, similarly we get one. So this has the effect of this multiplication of by one half on the input has the effect of taking these two arms and stretching them out quite a ways. And like I said, the inputs are coming at a slower rate. They're coming at a fraction of the rate they used to come. Before we plugged in 1 and we got 1. Now we have to go twice as far out to get the same value because the inputs essentially are coming in at half the rate they used to. Okay. Questions on this sort of thing? So translations in general preserve functions. If you have a function to start off with and you translate it, it's still going to be a function. If you stretch it, compress it in any direction, it will still be a function. No questions? Okay. Too easy? <laughs> right on par, maybe? Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, remember, it's your fault if you don't ask questions and you don't get it. So please ask. Please. Uh, I'm going to pretend to read my book for a split second while you think of some, maybe. Give you an opportunity to unashamedly ask something. Still nothing. Okay, that's okay. All right, next example.
There's lots of fun problems that you can do with things like this, not really relating uh, functions, right? Um, you know, determining if you still have a function or not, but more or so, more so like determining the new graph. So new graphs from old graphs. So if I said, hey, here is the graph of f. Yeah, it looks like a square root function, so maybe I'll, I'll even give it a symbol like this. Okay, I can't tell whether it is one or not. Um, you should be able to quickly tell me something like this. Like, what, what does the graph of g of x look like if g of x is the same as f of x minus 1? So think for a split second, how would you graph g? What is it? And now tell me, what do I do to the graph of f to graph g? Fred? Just move everything down one point. So this point goes down one. 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 Everything goes down one. Right? Okay. What about h of x? Where h of x is the same as f of x. And now we're going to take x plus 2. So you think about it for a second. Think about what we did to it. Well, since I called you out, go ahead. What do we do? Um, you would go up to. Up to? Yeah. Up to? What, did we did we take the output and raise it to, or did we adjust the input? Oh, no, no. We adjusted the input, right? The input has to do with things left and right, typically. Typically. There's some, again, some, some relationships with scaling, right? Stretching and compressing where... Modifying the input sometimes essentially has the same effect as modifying the output. But in this case, with addition, we're, we're not in that hatred zone. Yes, Gabe? Oh, move twice to the left. Move two points to the left, exactly. So the old zero right, used to be right here. But what number now corresponds to this same point? Well, it's negative 2. If we plugged in negative 2, that's going to give us the exact same thing that our original function gave us at zero, which is zero. So everything gets moved to the left two points. So this, this point moved left two. This point moved left two. This point moved left two. Things like that. Okay. Our H. Okay. And lastly. n of x is negative 2 of our original function. Very tempted to ask you. Why? Oh, you just look for you. You need something to wake you up. What does our new function look like? It's something flipped upside down in the graph. Why flipped upside down? Negative. negative makes all the positives. Negative. Very good. And then stretch two. So if we say this was one unit high, then this point is going to flip down to one unit below, but we're going to have to stretch it so it's going to be two units below. This one looks like, oh, I don't know, one and a half units high, kind of one and a half. So we flip it, and then we double this distance down because we're stretching it doubly. So our new graph looks something like that. Perfect. 
that is n of x. Very good. Are these all functions still? Yes. Good. You sure? Okay. What about the union of them? Is the union of all four of those a function? How close? How close? Yeah, how close to being a function are they? That I don't know, but I know it's not because you can you have different points for each right. corresponding x. So not even close, right? Right. We're like I got one, two, Nine. three, four, like four times too far. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Yeah. Very good. I should have given you a metric to just to answer that question. Yeah. But I thought maybe you'd have something witty. No. Okay. That's okay. I gave you no time to think about that. All right. Questions about those? No. Okay. There are, of course, other things we can do to functions. Uh, that are not as nice as just multiplying by a number or subtracting a number or what have you. Instead, we could do things like this. h of x equals f of x times g of x. We could do things like q of x equals f of x divided by g of x. We could do even messier things like this. C of x is equal to f of x, oh wait, f of g of x. Ugh. We get all sorts of crazy things with functions. We multiply them, we divide them. We use the output of one of them as the input for the next one. There's symbols to describe these things. So we, I'll show you those symbols, and, and that way you'll know what they look like. They're pretty self-explanatory. If you see something like this, parenthesis, f solid dot g of x, what that means is this. Evaluate f at x, evaluate g at x, multiply the two results. So it's function f times function g both evaluated at x. This one is denoted maybe like you'd expect f divided by g evaluated at x. It means exactly this. Plug in x to f, plug in x to g, take the quotient. This one always gets people, it's called the composition of two functions. It's like a, a, a small O brought to the center line uh, for characters. So this means f of g of x. Right? We always use that word of to say what's our input for the function. f of x. We've plugged in x to f. g of x. We've plugged in x to g. What do we plug into our function f? We plugged in g of x. So f of g, well, what do we plug into g? x. So f of g of x. So this open circle slash o is f of g of x. And this is, these three ways are, are ways to get some really, really nice, superb functions from old ones. Um, but what you really need to worry about with these things is domains. So let me erase, and I'm going to just keep the right side there. But I'll shift it over. OK, so f times g. Suppose we have two functions f and g, what is its domain? That's, that's the big question. Right, the, the domain are the numbers, the set of numbers we can plug in to it. Well, f times g 
has now two functions that it began on. So the numbers that we can plug into this one, we have to be able to plug into each individual function. Right? If I pick some number and I can plug it into f, that's okay, but I cannot plug it into g, that number is not in the domain of the function. Is that clear? Okay, so we need numbers that come from the domain of f and the domain of g. Intersection, where those two domains overlap. Example, let's say this is 0 to 5, this is d of f. This is the set of all numbers I can plug into the function f and get something out. Here's d of g. It's actually two separate intervals that are split apart by something. This one's 3 to 5, and this one's 7 to 10. Two intervals, but those are the numbers you can plug into g. What numbers can you plug into f times g? Just the overlapping parts. If you try to plug in anything over here, to the product, f will immediately give you a result. But g is not defined up there. g won't know what to do with, say, 2, or 1, or 0. Okay, It has no rule for that. Maybe it causes division by 0. Maybe it causes a square root of a negative. Similarly, these numbers, you can plug them into g, but you can't plug them into f. Questions on this? Okay, the next one is a quotient. I'm going to give you a second before I erase. Can I erase the example now? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it means uh, intersection. So the domain of f is a set of numbers, right? It's like I drew here. It's just a, a list. Maybe all of the numbers from 0 to 5. d of g is a set of numbers. So it's 3 to 5 and then 7 to 10 together. This is the intersection of those sets. Essentially, it's the, uh, it's the set of all things in both sets. Okay. So if something is in both df and it is in dg, then it is in the intersection of them. So that's why here we have these numbers in dg and they happen to be down here in df. So those numbers are in both. That's the intersection. Other questions? Yes. This is a, on a number line, this is the way you would graph it. As a set, you could say a couple different things. Interval notation, which is sometimes how you're asked, you take the left endpoint, comma, the right endpoint. These are both open circles, so I'm going to use open parentheses. If they were closed circles or any combination of open and closed, what I would do is use a closed bracket on one endpoint for the closed side and an open bracket on the other side. Okay? The, there's a lot of confusion surrounding these because these look like ordered pairs. But they're actually, uh, in this context, you can see they're describing an interval, a set of numbers, not a pair of numbers. Another way to describe these would be to use set builder notation. It uses this curly brace on the left. You say all numbers x 
such that a vertical line, sometimes it's a colon, sometimes it's actually words such that, sometimes this is abbreviated ST, sometimes it's abbreviated with the backwards epsilon. There's lots of different things that people do to do this, but a straight line is easiest for me to do. So all numbers x such that, what's true? x is less than 5 and greater than 3. So it gives you sort of a list representative, and then it tells you what numbers can be that value. So what, are the, what are the rules for the representatives in this set? Great question. Other questions? our next one. F over G, what's the domain of this one? And how are we doing our time? 14 minutes. We're good. Well, what's the domain of this one? Well, again, we need to make sure that anything we plug in can individually be plugged into F and into G, right? So we have this exact same thing of having the domain equal to the intersection of the domains. We can plug it into F and we can plug it into G, but there's one caveat, which is what? Exactly. So from this set, where we can plug it into F and we can plug it into G, we have to remove the set zeros of G. Right? So if there's any numbers in that list, that set, which is both DF and DG together, like <coughs> the intersection, if any of those numbers make G evaluate to zero, we have to throw it out. Very good. There's really simple examples of this, right? We can take x for our first function. What's its domain? If, if I give you a number, can you give me the same number back? Is that true for any number that I give you? Can you just repeat it back? Quick, let's test. One. Five. Negative five. Okay. Right. You convinced me. It's any real number or imaginary number. Right? I said a few of those, but I imagine them. You guys didn't respond. I just let it go. I'll let that go. <clears throat> G of x is very simple. We're going to add one to that. What is the domain of G? I'm not going to test you, you know, adding one to things. I know that can get embarrassing because I make mistakes like that all the time. It is just the same. Okay, what is the domain of, uh, of uh, f times f over g? Yeah. What's the intersection of those two? That's the first question. What's the intersection of all real numbers with all real numbers? All real numbers. But that's not the domain of D over, or sorry, F over G. We need to remember we have to take out the zeros of G. So what are we taking out? Same for you. Every real number except negative one. Because if we wrote this out, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. F over G of X is equal to x over 1 plus x, and if we plug in negative 1, we divide by 0. So in that first example, we were dividing by 1 plus sine of x, remember? We had the domain of the numerator, cosine was any real angle, any real number. The domain of the denominator was, again, any real number, but we had to take out all those multiples of 360 minus 90 degrees or plus 270. Same thing here. 
with a simpler function. Questions? Okay, now the most complicated one. This one really deserves more thought, right? Not too much more, but it does deserve some more thought. Maybe I'll just draw a picture real quick. Let's say this is our domain of G. G, as a function, takes something in here and brings it over to the range of G, right? That's what the function G does. What does f do? f takes something from its domain and sends it over to its range. So what's the domain of the composition? Where we take the output of g and plug it into our function f. So where do we start in all of this? Go ahead. Uh, like the output of g can't be zero out by that. Um, hmm. You know, that's OK. So what if x? Uh, f of x is just like um, 1 minus x squared, and g of x, say, is just, you know, it's just x. Can I plug in 1 to this composition? I plug in 1 to g, and I get 1. I give, I give that output here, and I get 0, right? So do I have a rule for that input? Yes. 1 goes to 0. 1, in this example, skips all of this and goes straight to 0. That's OK. <coughs> what needs to line up here? You know, what, what, what do we need to make sure it's a great example of track, by the way. The sport track. And relays. Anyone run track? Run relays? What must happen for you to win the relay? Okay. Assuming at least one more team finishes. Okay. What must happen for you to like win the relay? You go fast, right? Okay. There's like a crucial thing that you practice over and over and over again in a very short line. Before you run relays. Passing. Yeah, passing the baton, right? Okay. You've got like four people on the line, and once someone drops the baton, that's a big problem. Right? Then everyone trips. Not in just your lane, but every lane. There's a baton pass here. G takes an input, does something to it, puts it here. What does F do? F tries to take it. Right? It tries to do something with it, but what if the thing that G creates is not here? Drop the baton, right? So we need to make sure that there's some sort of like agreement between the range of G and the domain of F. So the domain begins as the domain of G. We start with, hey, we can plug in anything that G can handle. But we also need to make sure that whatever G outputs agrees here. 
So we need to take only those numbers which allow that to happen. So we take away the set of all numbers that G sends out of D F. It, you know, uh, here's the picture for this. You just erase this circle. Erase this circle. Re-put that one there and put this one here, and now it's a Venn diagram, right? This is the range of G, which includes a lot of things, including some things from the typical domain of F. If G sends something here, we're okay, because F can handle that. If G sends something here, that's not okay. So we need to remove all of the numbers from the domain of G, which gets sent into this area. Right? So we look at this and we say, oh, these numbers up here, we have to remove those because those are exactly the numbers which get sent here. All of these get sent to the intersection. So those numbers are okay. Question? Can you put a number up there? Yes, I can. That's a great question. Yes, I can. And that might be what we end up with. We've got three minutes. So this will be the last example of the day. How far did we get? Oh, perfect. Okay. I'm erasing the Venn diagram. That belongs in a history class or a... I belong in math class, yeah. Thanks so much. Stuff like that. Okay. F of x is, let's see, square root of x. I'll make this as simple as possible, okay? G of x is, let's say, x minus 1. I'll make it not, not the identity. So what is f of g of x? We can write down that rule. f of g of x is taking the output of g of x. The output is this, and plugging it into this. So it's the square root of x minus 1. What's the domain of g? All real numbers, yes. What numbers can you subtract one from? Any number. Okay, now my question is domain of f. And then furthermore, what elements of this set get put into the non-domain of f, if that makes any logical sense? Domain of f is only positive or non-negative numbers, right? So it's non-negatives. We can't plug in a negative number to that radical. So here is where we look back here and say we take any real number and we need to ask ourselves which one of these, which of these send, uh, send uh, are sent to negatives. What numbers by G are sent to negatives? So this is the, uh, I don't know what to call it. We'll just say, uh, we'll say not allowed values. What numbers from G's domain are sent to negative numbers. Anything less than one. Anything from one down to negative infinity is sent to a negative number. So what's the domain of our composition then? It's the domain of G after we take this away. So F 
has this domain, we can plug in one up to infinity. Anything from there. Because G knows exactly what to do with them, and F also knows exactly what to do with the result from G. Okay? That's it. There were a few more examples from the book uh, with compositions and whatnot, but that's it for 1.3. So next time we'll start on 1.4. It's Wednesday, so have a great Thursday tomorrow. I'll see you Friday. Homework's due tomorrow night. Quiz will be on Friday on 1.1 and 1.2. It'll be very short and similar to some homework problems. Okay? Have a great day. I'll see you next time. I'll pull this table away so you can walk in the table. Okay.